Hi friends, it's Emma here from Sunshine Lane, welcoming you to another episode of Coffee and Sunshine. In each episode of the podcast, we get to meet inspiring individuals who have navigated challenges, chased dreams and are discovering what truly brings them joy. Whether it's building fulfilling relationships, pursuing a passion project or finding peace within themselves, our guests share their personal journeys, actionable tips and hard-earned wisdom. There's so much to learn from everyday people navigating life's challenges. So let's find real life inspiration and explore hidden pathways to happiness one conversation at a time. On this episode, I've got a VVIP. I've got a very special guest who's smirking at me at the minute. (laughs) It is my lovely mum, Alison. Hi. My mum has been a much recommended guest when before when I just did my self care together podcast when it wasn't guests and then when I said what guests do you want me to interview people were saying your mum your mum um because I feel like those of you who follow what I do at Sunshine Lane and when it was at Plan Inspire Create my mum's always there supporting me you might have met her at events you'll have seen her in the community but sometimes people think, oh, it's just Emma's mum and she's just here because she's a helper. Whereas actually, I think it's fair to say we just share a lot of the same interests, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you would probably come with me, even if it wasn't like for a business thing to events yeah. and stuff, we might just choose to go together. Um, and this week we're actually on holiday um, at a craft hotel doing loads of craft activities, which has been really fun. But we thought we'd take a break. And record a podcast um, and talk about my lovely mum so that you can all get to know her a little bit better more than just, oh, that's Emma's mum, because all mums are an actual person and not just a mother. <laughs> so we thought we might go back in the time machine and do it in chronological order and talk about what your goals were when you were a child, what you thought you might like to do when you were older. Yeah. When I was um, quite little, I can remember only being three or four and saying that I wanted to be a nurse and also a teacher. It used to switch a little bit. It was a nurse or teacher when I was quite little. And I can remember my mum bought me a little nurse's outfit with a little um, nurse's bag with all the kit in. I used to play schools and I used to really enjoy Mm. playing schools. And I used to do that with you as well, Emma, Mm -hmm. actually, didn't I? When you were little. But, yeah, they were always sort of in the back of my mind. And then as I got a little bit older, teacher fell by the wayside. I don't know if that was when I started school and saw what teachers were really like. (laughs) (laughs) Or what you'd have to put up with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then I'd always got in the back of my mind that I wanted to be a nurse. Now... This year I've been diagnosed as autistic and obviously I didn't know when I was younger but when I left school I just didn't have the confidence to go into the world of work really Mm. and so I left school and I couldn't push myself to actually go out there and get any job never mind start training to be a nurse Yeah. and it wasn't until I was about 17 my brother came to visit me my older brother and we went into town and he said let's go in the job center and he sort of coaxed me into having a look at what jobs there were and there was an administrator's job it was data entry we asked about the job they rang the employer up and they said you can go now if you want for an interview (laughs) no pressure (laughs) yeah so I panicked and my brother said come on I'll take you Anyway, I had an on-the-spot interview and I got the job. So then I did that job until I left to go on maternity leave to have Emma, actually. So I ended up going down a different path, really. And, you know, I think nursing was always in the back of my mind, but I just sort of drifted into one sort of office job after another. and, And that's how it continued didn't it yeah so it's funny yeah. because grandma's a nurse so my mum's mum is a nurse do you, do you think you ever talked to her about that or did you never really have those kind of conversations about like oh I'm interested in the same thing how would I go about yeah. it blah blah no I never did and when I was really young she wasn't a nurse then oh yeah so yeah, yeah so I never I don't know where that came from 
Maybe you and inspired I, her to be a nurse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I think all along you'll you'll probably, as we talk about it more, I think it's just that wanting to do a job that helped people, I think. Yeah. Um, and nurse was one of those things that I thought, yeah, that will be helping people. But I drifted down a different route. Yeah. It's funny because when I think about you in work and, like, not having the confidence to go out and apply for jobs and stuff it's hard for me to pitch that in a way because my memories of you are all obviously like always working and doing mm. different jobs and going and getting different jobs but then knowing how autism affects us both I can also fully understand why that would be the case and I guess by the time I can like remember you working and whatever you'd kind of built up the masking in work situations and yeah. kind of how you you got more experience of like how to navigate jobs and stuff by that point. Yeah, I think it was all masking and then I would <laughs> panic and think they've offered me the job and I can't will I be able to do it because I've just yeah. bluffed my way through Well, the you interview. always yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, "Oh my god, what if I can't do it?" <laughs> well, you've got to do it now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably a familiar story to lots of people. It's just what jobs are available and I need to move out and pay the bills and what jobs mm. can I get to do that? But it's good that my uncle Andrew like took you out and said, come on, we're going to yeah. get you started on the path of something. Because yeah. you did end up obviously learning a lot of transferable skills and just getting that work experience under your belt. Yeah, because he said to me, you can type, because I did a touch typing mm. course when I was 16. So he said, you can type, you can do that let's just ask about it and then it just snowballed and they said you can go now <laughs> <laughs> and I was just didn't really have any choice yeah it was just like you're being carried along yeah like a snow on a snowball or something yeah but then you had me yeah and then obviously that changes the game a bit because mm. it's got to be things that fit around childcare and whatever mm. and then spoiler alert you and my dad split up when I was three and a half so then I was still pre-school age, yeah. really, and then you've got to think about it's harder to juggle childcare when there's only one of you. Yeah. So, yeah, and it was a case of then, it was just me and you, and it was a case of I've got to do any job that I can find to pay the bills, really, and I did yeah. do some jobs. You did. <laughs> do you think that became, like, your motivation? Yeah, Mm. Yeah, it was just, I've got to do it. So I think that's where that strength and resilience came from because I just thought, I'm the breadwinner. I've got to mm. to care for you and I've got to be that strong person. So I think that was the drive, that, you know, that enabled me to go out and ask about jobs and get yeah. jobs. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, for me, like... Obviously, when it was just me and you, it was a time where being a single mum, there was a lot more stigma around it. Yeah. And it, particularly at my school, I remember, because I went to a girls' grammar school and all most of the girls were, like, really posh and snobby. Mm. And I was the only girl in my class whose mum and dad weren't together, I think, which you couldn't imagine that now. It'd probably <laughs> be the other way around, wouldn't it? Yeah. And if ever anyone made comments or I felt people were being... Well, I still do now. If I feel people are making derogatory comments about single parents and things, I used to get really defensive for you. And I'd mm. be... Because I could see. I was like, no, my mum's working really hard and she's just doing whatever is like the best job she can find to pay the bills and she's working really hard even if it's something she doesn't enjoy and like I don't think that was ever really lost on me I think mm. I always knew that yeah, yeah these aren't really the kind of jobs you you're not getting job satisfaction no. necessarily mm. so yeah but let's talk about some of the weird and wonderfuls well, I was going to say, actually, if we take a step back to before me and your dad split up, yeah. <laughs> it was my first uh, adventure into something that I thought, oh, <laughs> that's going to help people. I decided you were only about 18, 12 months, 18 months old, and I decided I wanted to be a special constable, yeah. which now it's the PC PCSOs. PCSO. 
but they get paid, don't they? Special mm. constables didn't get paid. It was voluntary. The only money you got was a shoe allowance oh. <laughs> for plodding the beat. Yeah. And but I, I trained. <laughs> I you didn't get much training for that, and you were thrown in at the deep end. And I, I think I only did that for six months, and just felt completely out of my comfort zone. And I can remember one incident that made my mind up really that we were called out and there was about 50 youths that had gathered on this housing, housing youths, estate. Not youths not youths yeah <laughs> gathered on this housing estate and there was only me and this sergeant that was out with me and they could obviously see that I was nervous mm. and so they were intimidating me and shouting things at me and you weren't allowed to say anything back and all sort of crowding around me and I just thought I can't you know and now I know I'm autistic. Yeah. <laughs> I, that was my worst nightmare, yeah. and um, and I just couldn't couldn't deal with that. And I just thought this is not for me. How is this helping people? Yeah. Nobody's got respect for me, uh, you know, and what I'm trying to do, and it's not really helping people. So I decided that wasn't for me. Well, talk about a scary job, and you're not even getting paid for it. Yeah. You're not even getting paid to put up with the abuse from people no, out in it. public. So that one wasn't for you. No, no, I hated that one. And so we moved house because your dad got a promotion and yeah. we, we were able to, to buy a house. So we moved house to an area that was a few miles away, that's sort of the next area to where we lived. And um, we lived practically opposite the fire station. Mm. You could see the fire station from where we were. And they had this big open day to become a retained firefighter, to train to become a retained firefighter. And retained means that you you just on call. So you work part-time hours on call and you have a pager. When your pager goes off, you just run and you'd got to be able to respond within three minutes, I think it was. So because we literally lived across the road, mm. I could just leg it across well, there. did you have to stay at home in your uniform? No, your uniform was there. Oh, you got to get over there and whip it in on. your lockers. Yeah, get everything on, and you just had a pager. and And we worked it out because your dad worked nights. I would do like late afternoons, and I'd do four hours. I think mm. it was three days a week, something like that. And you would just respond, so you weren't working a long shift and going and just sitting there, yeah. waiting mm. for a call your pager would go off, the adrenaline would kick <laughs> in and you'd run across the road. And I absolutely loved that mm. and really enjoyed it. But then I was just getting into it. Oh, and actually I was the... Because it was in the West Midlands and I was the first female retained firefighter in the West Midlands. Um, but it didn't go down well, actually, with oh. some of the wives of the firemen oh, having a female on. in the station you know for god's yeah. sake so but i really enjoyed it because it was just that adrenaline and then you're going out and helping people yeah. and yeah i really enjoyed it but then me and your dad split yeah. up and i wasn't able to do it anymore because i hadn't got child care for you yeah. so i had to leave and again i'd only been doing it for a matter of months and yeah. then then had to stop so, yeah, two two uniformed jobs, yeah. as it was. <laughs> You're having a go at, at all the helping professions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we moved, I suppose. Yeah, then we moved, yeah. So we moved closer to your grandma, didn't mm -hmm. we? Uh, just so that I'd got a bit of support. And, and then that was the time where I just had to get factory jobs, like really poorly paid jobs just to pay the bills and make ends meet and just think I worked in a sewing factory, a bottle factory, all sorts of things just to try and yeah. make sure that, you know, we could pay the bills and survive and you had yeah. what you needed really. So, yeah, it wasn't, they weren't jobs that I enjoyed, but it was a case of these are the jobs that are available. Yeah, and I mean... Yeah, when I think about it, it makes me really angry, like, some of the jobs you had because, like, for example, when you worked in the factories, I'm like, you'd have to ask to go to the toilet and then mm. it'd be like, you know, would they let you or not and how quick you've got to be and blah, yeah. blah, and I think, like, 
what about people's basic human needs and treating people with a bit of respect and decent like dignity yeah. when i worked in the the bottle factory the supervisor had a little black book a little notebook yeah. and pencil and if you wanted to go to the toilet you had to put your hand up <clears throat> and you used to have to ask to go to the toilet and he'd say I'll tell you when you can go and he'd wait until nobody else was in the toilet and you had to go one at a time that's yeah and get back quick sharpish <laughs> well that's not always how going to the toilet works and not being <laughs> too graphic but what if you're a woman and it's your time of the month and you yeah. need to be up and down yeah or like if you need to go you need to go yeah well, that's just yeah it's just not okay is it mm. and then they sent me to scotland for a week didn't they to yeah. a different factory yeah yeah and, and then obviously <clears throat> it's juggling things like that you think well how am i going to tr- juggle childcare now what am i going to do but then if i don't do it then I, i'm going to lose my job and that's just a whole boatload of stress no one needs yeah yeah so yeah so I did quite a few (laughs) different jobs but you kind of ended up going back into the admin yeah I did I got a job as a a personal assistant to a managing director in a local company yeah um to start with and yeah and went back down the admin route really because it was what I had known and what I'd done so again, just drifting into what I knew I could do because, yeah, I don't know how I had the confidence to put myself out of my comfort zone yeah. and do the the firefighting. No, or, yeah, <laughs> because that's like, yeah, it's a major. Like you said, the adrenaline boost and it's so far removed from anything. Like for everyone, if you've never done a job like that before, it's so far removed from day to day life. Yeah. They did They did help me to start with because on the open days they'd give you these tests like you had to climb up the ladder to the top of the tower and things like mm. this and I was really nervous and so they said come back and we'll, we'll help you, we'll give you a few sessions of helping you do it and then you can sit the test again yeah. sort of thing. So they did help. That's nice. Mm. Yeah. So then going forward in the time machine <laughs> to the time where obviously I'm getting older and I'm thinking about moving out of home and I'm working and off in the world doing my things obviously that kind of changed things because like you were saying your motivation was making sure things were sorted for me yeah. but obviously I'm an only child and when I left home you didn't have that motivation anymore so what was that change like yeah that was really hard actually I think because my focus had been you and making sure you were okay and doing things together and when you left home and you went to uni didn't you and Mm -hmm. when you went to uni it just felt like well what do I do now yeah because Emma's been my focus and you know what am I gonna? What is there? And I and I did yeah. struggle with depression. Yeah. For a while, because I just didn't know what my role was anymore and uh, felt a bit lost really. Yeah. Uh, for a while, and then I got some help with depression. Um, I had some therapy, medication, and about eighteen months of that, and came out the other side and started to focus more on me, mm. and thought well, what, what is it, you know, instead of looking at the negatives, looking at the positives and thinking, well, I can do what I want to do now because I, I don't, you know, I'm not focusing on you. Yeah. So what is it I want to do? And then my thoughts went back to nursing and the thing that I'd always wanted mm. to do as a child. But bizarrely, as a child, I always thought about adult nursing in terms of physical health. Mm. Um, But because I'd struggled with my mental health after you left home, well, I think before that anyway, just anxiety, but because I'd struggled with depression after you left home, I got drawn to mental health. Yeah. And I was just completely focused on, you know, these mental health nurses have really helped me. I feel like a different person now and I would love to be able to do that for somebody else. Mm. So everybody thought I'd 
gone a bit mad because <laughs> I was in a I was in a good a well paid job at that point because I'd worked myself up into a senior management position. Yeah. So I was I was, you know, earning a decent salary by that point. But I just thought this is not rewarding. Who am I helping? What am I doing? other than shuffling figures and papers and yeah. uh, I'm not really doing anything to help anyone. So, you know, t explaining to everybody, I'm going to give all of that up, go back into education and train to be a nurse. People thought I'd just lost the yeah. plot. <laughs> Especially because I left school and I didn't do any A-levels because I hadn't got the confidence to. Mm -hmm. So it was a case of instead of doing a three-year degree... It took me four years because I had to do GCSEs and A-levels. Yeah. So I did the GCSE, English and Maths, three A-levels. I did Psychology, Double Science. Mm -hmm. Double Science and Psychology, is that all I did? It would be three. Possibly, yeah. yeah. And all of that was done in a year. Yeah. <laughs> to get accepted into university to do a degree. Oh, and didn't you have to do some general study skills stuff? Oh, yes. Yeah, general studies, yeah. And I owned I, some IT stuff. Right, yeah. yeah, which obviously was never going to be a problem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and then the nervous thing was, which university am I going to go mm. to? So I put four, is it four that you put in? Four different unis or five different yeah. unis? And... I chose to go to the smallest one yeah. for a couple of reasons. One, because of my anxiety and it being a complete change, unfamiliar environment. Mm -hmm. But it was also in the town where I grew up as a child and so it felt more familiar to me, even mm -hmm. though I didn't live there anymore. I thought, yeah, I'm going to feel more comfortable yeah. there. So I chose that one and it did have good... Um, reviews they were top of the tables actually for mental health nursing so that was coincidentally mm. a good thing yeah <laughs> so yeah and then off I went you just left uni yeah as I started you went back in yeah well not back in you went in <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so I did my year which was your I did my year doing my A-levels which was your final year at uni yeah and then you just left and started work as I was starting uh, first, my degree, yeah. Yeah, degree, mm. yeah. Then I qualified 10 years ago. God, yeah. that's flown. Yeah. So just to circle back to when you were speaking about getting your mental health support before we go down the nursing days, do you think there was maybe more of a need there than you'd realised, but you were kind of so focused on me and what you needed to do to keep the house going and the mum role that you hadn't really realised how much you needed supporting yeah definitely I think I was just focused on I put a lot of pressure on myself actually because I thought I've got to be a mom and a dad yeah to you you know I've got to I think I overcompensated and wanted to not by way of spoiling you and yeah. giving you things and things like that but put pressure on myself to make sure that you had a well-rounded parenting, you yeah. know. So, yeah, and that is hard when you've got nobody. We didn't live near family either, did we? No. So it was hard. There was, you know, there wasn't that support network around me, so it was difficult. And I think a way of me, also a way of me... Um, distracting from my anxiety and my worries and my mental health was just to throw everything into making sure you were yeah. okay so it wasn't until you'd gone that yes it was that empty nest syndrome but it was also that now all my problems have come to the surface yeah which yeah. I think is probably the same for a lot of parents and mums in particular that take on the bulk of the caring work in the main obviously not in every family but it's kind of you know it's more expected for women to take on the majority of the caring role and I imagine that is the case and that it can all bubble up to the surface quite quickly when all mm. of a sudden you've not got those distractions and you're just with 
alone with your thoughts kind of thing. Yeah, definitely, because also you had a very active yeah. um, extracurricular yeah. activity programme, didn't you? Yeah. Because you used to do something six days a week. Yeah. You used to do dancing, uh, singing. You were with a, a model agency at one point yeah. as a child growing up yeah. and we used to do stuff all over the place. You did a bit of drama. Yeah, like, not drama with other people, but, like, speaking poetry and prose yeah. and, yeah, and that you were kind of in thing. And you were in a local play, weren't you, theatre? Yeah, 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 yeah. And things like that. So every night after work there was something going on yeah. that I was, ta- Mum's taxi yeah. taking Quick you Quick dinner, to. then we've got a whisk yeah. here, whisk there. But I used to stay and enjoy watching as yeah. well. And then on a Saturday you would have something as well. So Sunday was the only day. So I'd be working full time, doing those things in the evening and a Saturday morning. And then we'd just have, you know, sort of Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday yeah. just for me to get all the jobs done <laughs> and start it all again yeah. yeah but I did enjoy it and I met people through yeah. you know other mums and and I did enjoy it so there was always something going on so there wasn't time for me to sit down and think about things and how I felt about things and looking back now and knowing that I'm autistic mm. I understand why I had a lot of anxiety but threw myself into your activities to to distract from yeah. that and then when you went to uni then I was just left with all of those thoughts and all of that mm. anxiety about navigating the world and social socially yeah. and things like that yeah and I think like for me I could see obviously when you had that mental health support there's still a big gap between then and finding out you were autistic. Yeah, yeah. But I think it made a massive difference in terms of you just seemed so much calmer and more comfortable in yourself after that time. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think I, think I just saw things differently and I felt, if I say this to people, they probably think that's a bit extreme, but I felt like, wow, it's like I've just woken up from, you know, like I've come out of this dark cloud or something. And it just felt like, wow, so this is what it's supposed to feel like. And yeah, so it was just a massive shift for me in terms of my mental health. I always have anxiety, but you know, have that self-awareness and and able to manage it better. Yeah, I guess maybe you tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but, like, if you're in a situation where you just feel like, oh, this is always how I'm going to feel, this is just how I am, then you've kind of lost... Like, there's no hope in that, is there? Mm. Whereas if you're able to start seeing things a different way, then even just believing that you can feel different like it opens up all these new experiences to you doesn't it definitely I felt more confident to be able to then think well maybe I can focus on me now and what would I like to do whereas Mm. before I just convinced myself that I couldn't do anything because I was too anxious to do anything other than be your mum and and be there for you but as a person in my own right I just thought oh no I'm never going to be able to do other things that I might want to do so it just definitely built my confidence in me as a person definitely yeah yeah so then I guess having such a profound experience I don't know how to phrase that (laughs) it's I guess it makes a lot of sense why you would choose mental health nursing and be drawn towards that area of nursing as opposed to another maybe if you'd gone down the nursing route before that experience you might not have considered mental health nursing in the same way it was never on my radar actually it was just I always thought a nurse this is what a nurse does she makes people physically who are physically unwell, you help to make them better and comfortable. And, yeah, it wasn't on my radar yeah. at all. But you had to do... So in the first year of your course, all the nurses from the different branches were together, weren't they? Yeah, we did our lectures together. Mm. 
but all our placements were mental health. Oh, I yeah. didn't I didn't have to mm. do any physical health placements. We did three placements a year and they were all mental health placements in different settings. But in the first year we focused on we did do the theory of all the biological mm-hmm. stuff. And then in years two and three, it was just purely mental health focused. Mm. And I specifically remember you like really getting into it and just seeing you like, gosh, she's really enjoying this. She's loving this. You liked your placements, although you struggled with (laughs) every time starting something new and it Mm. being unknown, which obviously now we know you're autistic. That makes total sense. But, But then you would annoyingly just be starting to get into it and the placement would end because yeah. nursing is shorter placements than I had in social work isn't it yeah but then you also really loved the academic side which you'd always said to me I'm thick I'm yeah. thick I didn't get good grades at school blah blah yeah and I think yeah at primary school I was top of the class and then when I went to secondary school I just felt a bit um self-conscious mm. and um, didn't want to put my hand up in class and things like that. I think I was more aware that I was different. So I sort of fell back a little bit in secondary school mm. and so that's why I didn't do A-levels and I felt, well, I'm thick, I can't do anything. Yeah. So when I went to uni and when I did my A-levels, and found that it was a subject that I was really interested in. Mm. I was just flying. Yeah. And and I really enjoyed it and I was a proper geek. Yeah, you were. <laughs> and there's nothing geek. wrong with that. I remember in an A-level psychology exam, I got 59 out of 60. And I was questioning the <laughs> the tutor why... I hadn't got 60 out of 60 <laughs> because I got the question right. And he said, well... You know, you could have got two point. You could have got two marks for that particular question if you'd have said a little bit more. But you only got one mark because you didn't expand. And you know, and I used to put so much pressure on myself. I think yeah. because I thought I've got to prove to myself that I'm not sick and yeah. I can do this. I'm sure people people think I'm crazy for giving up a well paid job to to go into education yeah. as a mature student. And I've got to prove to everybody that I can do this so I did put a lot of pressure on myself but I did enjoy really enjoy Mm. the academic side because it was something that I was really interested in so I think now I know I'm autistic it was my special interest yeah (laughs) yeah and I think it is a lot and for those of us that are perfectionists which I know there's a lot that listen to this podcast (laughs) and in the community it is really hard isn't it when you're in those environments as well when people are like oh what did you get what did you get and they're all comparing and then you feel like oh does that mean you know I'm not very good at this because I didn't get this grade or whatever Mm. and there's the potential for it to just suck the enjoyment out of it but I think you yeah it probably was a big special interest for you and yeah. you did really enjoy it and that came through. It was all I focused on for three mm. years. I just lived and breathed mental health and yeah. whatever placement I was on, it would be different settings, different mental health settings and so then I'd do loads of research mm. into that and, yeah, it would just completely take over. I wasn't interested in anything else at all. On my days off, I'd still be researching yeah. things and, yeah. yeah. And those three years went by in a blink, really, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then I got, you graduated. And I got a first-class honours. So you're not <laughs> thick, are you? Yeah. You'd have probably still picked fault with something, even at that, yeah. oh, well, maybe I could have got another percent or something. But <laughs> zoom out, bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and then it was time to enter the world of work again, which mm. I guess is a scary thing, because at least with your placements, you know, you're being sent on your placements and they're sorted out for you and it's not like you've got to go and interview. So what was it like then thinking, oh, God, I've got to interview for my first nursing job? Yeah, that was scary. But um, I was still at uni when I got offered a job. So I think I was the first one, actually, in our 
cohort that got offered a job so I knew that I'd secured something mm -hmm. but it's just when you qualified and a registered nurse you, people just expect you to know everything from day one and you don't yeah. you know you don't learn everything on a placement you're on a placement for 10 12 weeks then you go back into uni then you go on a different placement that's a completely different mental health setting and you're starting again yeah. so you don't know everything but people see you in that uniform and think they know what they're doing and especially because I was older mm. people just assumed that I'd been qualified for years yeah. and I would be masking and coming across as confident yeah so people just assumed that I knew everything which was difficult yeah because I suppose particularly when it's you're someone where it's hard to admit yeah you don't know things and you don't want to come across as stupid and like you've got that negative self-talk going on where like oh well I can't say I don't know this because what will they think and what if they think I can't do the job and what will that mean and then all of a sudden mm. it's a big catastrophe in your head yeah. that's quite hard to manage isn't it yeah definitely yeah especially yeah. in an environment where it's probably understaffed all the time definitely I always knew that I wanted to work in the community as a mental health nurse because that was my experience mm. of how I'd been helped and I thought I'd love to be able to do that but when you're a newly qualified nurse a lot of trusts nhs trusts say that you have to have two years experience as a qualified nurse before you can do a community post so i thought well, i'm going to prove that i can manage risk uh, i'm going to throw myself in at mm. the deep end so i went to work with males in a secure mental health hospital where not only did they have mental health difficulties, they also had, they were also neurodivergent, so autism, ADHD, or both, mm -hmm. and some had learning disability difficulty as well. So, yeah, it was a case of, I'm going to prove that I can do this. I'm mm. going to throw myself in at the deep end and it'll be sink or swim. Yeah. <laughs> so that was petrifying, actually. But I worked there for six months. And then, surprisingly, I managed to get a, a community post. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't two years, which I was really surprised about. I managed to get that post in within six months. And then I was a community mental health nurse. And I actually bumped into the, the, the nurse who was my nurse yeah. when I was on the opposite end. Mm. And she was actually on the interview panel. Yeah. And she telephoned me and said, are you? She said, you've got an interview with us. Can I just check? Are you Alison Fox? Blah, blah, blah. And she was just checking to see if I was yeah. the same person that she helped sort of four or five years before. And I said, yes, I am. And then she said, "Do you? will you feel uncomfortable if I interview you? And I said, no, that's fine. And I actually wanted her to interview me because I thought, I want to show you mm. how much I've grown and yeah. how much I've changed. So she was only one of the people on the yeah, interview yeah. panel. And yes, yeah, so I did get the job, but she worked for a different team. So I wasn't working alongside her, but yeah. Yes, so yeah, and that was really lovely to see yeah. her and show her, look, look how I am now. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you think yeah. about it, that's a really quick turnaround from like when you had your support yeah. to being interviewed for yeah. that type of job, Yeah. having to go through all that training. Yeah. And it must have actually been really lovely for her to see yeah, she how, did. Yeah, yeah, she how did different you that. were and the she kind of inspired you in a way to like want to do a similar thing. Yeah, she did say that and she just was so happy to see because I know as a nurse now when I work with people and I sometimes people stick in your mind and I think I wonder how they're doing now. Yeah. So for her it must have been nice for her to see a success story mm -hmm. I guess from the person that she met and worked with for 18 months and then sort of four or five years down the line, here I am mm. doing what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about the job 
and the area of mental health nursing you work in now? So, yeah, I've worked in a few different community settings, working with different um, patient groups, but I feel comfortable. I feel really happy and comfortable in the role that I'm in now, which is working in perinatal mental health. So our team are a specialist team that work with pregnant ladies and new mums with babies up to 12 months old who are struggling with their mental health. So it's the sort of moderate to severe mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, really. And, yeah, it's really lovely to work with that client group. And we actually, we're focusing on the family, not just the mum. So, yeah. you know, there might be a family with other children as well as the baby. You, you focus on the partner's mental health see uh, if they're struggling with anything and support mm -hmm. them as well so it's really lovely to be able to see a massive change in the family as a whole mm -hmm. from when you start working with that mom and that family to when you discharge them yeah there are some quite upsetting and distressing families that you come mm. across where you know children might not be being cared for as they should be cared for and or families in living in poverty mm. and things like that so that side of it is um you know upsetting at times to go yeah. home and think about how other yeah. people are living but you know we can signpost them to different agencies that, and hopefully get help for them and um and that sort of thing but yeah i really enjoy working in with that client group now mm. and seeing the change not just in the mum but the whole family because when the mum's mental health is not good you know the the knock-on effect of that is the partner is stressed the children pick up on yeah. things and and you know it's just the whole home environment is different from when we start working with them to when we finish so mm -hmm. it's really lovely to see the the journey if i can say yeah. the j word yeah well yeah <laughs> gotta say the j word and what would you say is your motivation now working with that group because i do think it's quite funny sometimes i chuckle to myself and i think but you don't really like babies that much because <laughs> sometimes you struggle sensory wise with yeah. the high pitched baby screams and do, cries yeah. and yeah. so i always see you as someone who's like oh she's not the biggest fan of babies like you're not go gooey <laughs> over people's babies necessarily yeah i do like babies it's just yeah. the noises they make yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, not, I don't want to start a vicious rumour that you hate babies. <laughs> Baby hates her. No, but since I, right from when I started working with the team, which was just over two years ago, I went to my manager and I asked about, I said that autism was my special interest yeah. and this is before I was diagnosed. But um, I was diagnosed, yeah, which is kind diagnosed. of what had started it off. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd done a lot of reading up and learning on autism in females and I asked my manager, is there anything that they currently do as a team to support neurodivergent women? And my manager at the time said, oh, we don't really get any of those coming through. <laughs> um, and she didn't see it as a problem because I said I'd like to be the lead nurse in, in, in that area. Yeah. And she said, no, no, we don't really get any autistic women coming through or anything like that. But as time went on and I was working with ladies it was very clear that they were undiagnosed yeah. and not even uh, that much time went by and no. you were like it's more people than not coming yeah, through the definitely, service because one thing that I learned is that autistic women or neurodivergent women when massive hormonal changes happen like puberty mm. pregnancy and childbirth and the menopause that triggers that escalates all your the difficulties you know the sensory sensitivities all the things that you might struggle with as a neurodivergent yeah. woman it magnifies all of that so women who have sort of managed to get through day to day all of a sudden they've had this massive change in hormones and it's triggered all these autistic challenges 
um, behaviours, however you want to describe it. And so we had more and more women being referred in with mental health problems mm-hmm. and, it, and it turned out that it was a result mm-hmm. of them being autistic. Yeah. And so more and more were coming through. I referred a lady who I identified as she's likely to be autistic, referred her for an assessment and she was diagnosed and more and more of that was happening. Mm. And so I was sort of wanting to champion that and went back to my manager and asked her again and she said, you can be the neurodiversity link nurse for the team and people come to me now and ask me for advice um, other nurses and other mm-hmm. professionals in the team they ask me what do you think about this person I, I'm, I'm a bit unsure but I'm, I'm sure there's something there yeah and then I'll tell them how to refer so yeah I'm sort of champion I'm using my job as a as a sort of a platform mm. really to yeah. be able to talk about my other passion yeah. and support women and, and I've actually got women on my caseload at the moment who are really really struggling as new mums because they're likely neurodivergent and everything's magnified since the baby's come the sensory aspect of it crying baby the smells of the pooey nappies and all of those things and the massive change Mm. so yeah I can use my knowledge in that area now to help mums and they usually come to me, they're usually allocated to me, (laughs) which is really lovely. So, yeah, I love working in perinatal, but also being able to champion, you know, and fight and support women who are struggling because they're likely to be neurodivergent. Because as well, there's that, for a lot of women, they end up being misdiagnosed with mental health conditions. And that's not to say the people you work with don't have mental health difficulties but you quite often find that women who are late diagnosed autistic have been misdiagnosed with different mental health difficulties in the past particularly if they have got some mental health difficulties and there's a big crossover isn't there where being autistic at the very least is going to give you some level of anxiety and depression if nothing else because it's just life's more difficult and anxiety is kind of intrinsic to autism and all those things well yeah definitely and I from from my experience I was diagnosed with anxiety depression Mm -hmm. and OCD traits yeah but I think they were just sort of ritualistic behaviors that I needed to do to be Mm -hmm. able to feel comfortable yeah definitely and it's interesting how differently that would be perceived by a mental health professional who doesn't have that background and and that knowledge and obviously has a bias towards looking for traits of mental health conditions because that's their job so they're not necessarily thinking about traits of other things that are some other person's job and Mm. so and there is yeah such a big crossover between lots of things but I think some of the things you've been able to put in place even just in that short time you've worked there are amazing like thinking about we've had chats about the sensory differences and difficulties of pregnancy and then of things like breastfeeding Mm. because I've always said to you I'm not sure I'd like to be pregnant because the thought of having a moving thing Mm. inside me that I've got no control over and people normally say to that oh well if you are pregnant you'd feel different blah blah Mm. but some people don't feel different no I didn't It sounds awful (laughs) saying I didn't like being pregnant. I was happy to be pregnant, but I didn't like the experience. Yeah. I didn't feel comfortable breastfeeding, and I think that was a sensory thing. I just could not imagine that, so I didn't even try it, and that was frowned upon years ago when you were born. But, yeah, and I knowing how I struggled when you were born and you were a, a, a small baby, I can sort of relate how I felt and how all the anxieties I had to the women that we work with now and going back to the the neurodivergent link I we have put a lot of things in place the way we assess 
women now and the questions that we ask in terms of do they have any communication difficulties, any sensory sensitivities, we put a, we add it to their birth plan and send this off to maternity services, anything that they might struggle mm. with in hospital, lighting, noise, all of these sorts mm -hmm. of things and you know all of this has changed since I've worked there and you know and I'm proud of that because I've been able to use my knowledge of your experience mm. and my experience to be able to help other people mm. and oh yeah I think you should be very proud and like we were saying earlier as well a lot of the support that you get signposted to as a new mom is groups and things and if you're neurodivergent that's maybe not the best like it's not the easiest thing for you to access anyway mm. and then you've got that pressure on top where you don't want to admit you're struggling because you feel like you need to be this amazing mom and like you were saying how when you were a mom and you felt like you needed to kind of do all the best things and prove you could do it and I think that you know each one of those things is hard enough and then put them both together and it just must be incredibly difficult to yeah meet other people with similar experiences and be able to openly share those experiences without yeah. feeling judged I think so and so uh, we were talking about something earlier yeah. weren't we funnily enough um, the work never ends no no we're on holiday <laughs> on a crafting week and we sat there in the bar talking about this what yeah. the, you know and and how I felt as a mum and did I go to mum and baby groups with you and um, and I said actually when I go back to work I'm going to speak to my manager and see if we can set up a mum and baby group for neurodivergent women or those that we feel are even if they're undiagnosed a very small group where they'll feel more comfortable because you know they all feel the same they're all mm. struggling the same and we have set up a group last year which was f an antenatal group for mums to prepare them for all the sensory difficulties that they might have that's really good. so that's good so it's preparing them for labor and the hospital stay and the early weeks if they struggle with those sorts of things but i think you know once baby's born then that's a massive change and yeah. actually like you say going to a mom and baby group was my worst nightmare <laughs> so yeah I, I just think I can suggest that and see if we can set something up just a small group for those women that struggle with things like that and I'd be happy to get involved with that so it's just thinking about how else we can help people rather than just the conventional let's treat your anxiety and depression or whatever it might be it's looking at the the bigger picture really so yeah I, know, I never switch off from work <laughs> no however with that said yeah and zooming out and looking the, at the big picture you are more than just Gemma's mom and you are more than just a nurse so how do you find balancing life when you have such a special interest in a work related thing mm. it's hard because i think work is my passion and everything else has fallen by the wayside mm. so when i'm interested in something it's a hundred percent and i'm blinkered obviously supporting you with sunshine lane and i love the planning side because I love to be organized and so mm -hmm. that was why I got interested in in, yeah. you, in the things that you do I love going to planner events and things like that but apart from that it's just work 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 I never switch off we've sat tonight and spoken about work <laughs> so my brain always goes 100 miles an hour anyway so when I can't sleep I'm lying there thinking yeah. about things like that but coming away this week has sort of sparked that passion again for doing something for myself doing something along the craft side because I've always enjoyed doing that mm -hmm. sort of thing and we've done a lot together haven't we yeah, over, the years, over and, the years and uh, I love try I love being creative and making things and I've tried lots of different crafts in the past I have a couple of ideas that have 
sparked my interest from things that we've done this week and mm -hmm. now I'm thinking actually you know I want more I want that better work-life balance and this is my new goal I did say it at the beginning of this year yeah but it hasn't happened but I think actually stepping back and taking that time away this week to do something creative has sparked that interest again I've got a she shed which <laughs> <laughs> which we had put up a few months ago in the garden and uh, it's just there and I haven't done anything with it and it's always been when I've got time I'll do this when I've got time I'll do that but now I think the creative juices are flowing mm -hmm. and we've sat tonight and spoken about a few ideas haven't we yeah and I think I've got that passion because I have been talking about reducing my hours at work now I'm getting older yeah and maybe dropping one day and working four days a week instead of five and now I've got all these sort of amazing goals going around in my head this week about what I might want to do with that time so uh, yeah watch this space really mm -hmm. I think because Very I've now I've achieved my goal to be a nurse and I've still got that passion for that but I think I want something more in my personal life something just for me yeah so, yeah so I've got some ideas of mm. what that might be I think it just goes to show sometimes putting yourself in a different environment and taking a complete step back from things it just gives you that headspace to get a bit of perspective doesn't it and think well yeah I'm focusing all my time in this one area how can I balance it what might I do sometimes it's hard to do that when you're just trying to get through the day to day and you're thinking well I'll oh, I've worked all these hours today and then mm. I just need to get these things done so that I can go to bed and get up and do it all again yeah. tomorrow. Especially working in the NHS where yeah. there's no money and I suppose to work a nine-to-five job Monday to Friday, but I start at eight o'clock. I'll finish six, seven, eight o'clock at night sometimes just to get everything done because there aren't enough hours in the day. Then on a weekend, I'll just crash. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to do something for me. And I'm there for everybody else. And we've spoken about this in in the community self-care together and the video chats that we have on Patreon. And yeah, you promote self-care. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that. I'm there making sure everybody else is okay. And there's never enough hours in the day for me to do something that makes me feel good and nourishes me yeah so um yeah i've had a, a stepping away and having a week away has has given me some perspective on that and made me think you know i need to do definitely want need to do something different but now i want to do something different i've known for a long time i need to do yeah. something different but um, it'll be sometime never. But now yeah. I've had, <laughs> now I've had a, a turnaround really, and I've got ideas and some passions about what I want to do. Then I'm more likely to to mm. do that. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> That's what we're all about. Yeah. So, if you had a piece of advice for people who are looking to work towards their goals and they might be on that journey they might be like you where they were nowhere near where, where what they really felt they enjoyed and wanted to do if you had a good piece of advice what would it be I think just never say never I think sometimes if I'd have if I'd have trained to be a nurse when I was younger I don't think it would have worked. It wasn't the right time. Mm. So you might have goals, but sometimes it just doesn't align with what's going on in your life. So don't dismiss that because if it's something that you really want to do, you can put that on the back burner and park it. And sometimes you might decide that, no, that was wrong for me and I don't want to do it. But also you might think, yeah, but not right now. Um, you know, I'm just going to sit on that and leave that on the back burner and, and then the time will appear where, mm -hmm. yes, this, you know, it feels right now. I think I felt if I'd have done it 10, 20 years before, it just wouldn't have worked. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good piece of advice. And we were talking about it earlier this week, actually, where 
I said to you when I was little, I always used to play shops and mm. like then I had a job where I was a Saturday girl in a shop and I ran the shop and I it's probably one of my favourite jobs. And then Tell everybody what you did. Oh, I worked mm. in a health food shop, like a little like Holland and Barrett, but it was an independent shop. And they also sold like some food items and stuff, like a little food counter. And people would come in and say, I'm struggling with headaches or whatever. And because with supplements, you're not allowed to say like you are with medications that this is definitely for this and this is definitely for that. So they can't put it on the bottles. So I had all these massive great books and so I'd be, oh, let me get the books out and I'd have a look and say, well, maybe this might work, maybe that might work. And then my boss used to do food intolerance testing. So I ran the shop while he was doing the testing. And I had come to know the shop because I'd had food intolerance testing there when I was 15. And they also sold kind of free from allergy friendly foods before there was really you could get them in the supermarkets mm. and <laughs> and so people had come out all sad like oh I can't have milk anymore or whatever and I'd be like don't you worry let me show you which the best things are <laughs> okay. and it's awful now when I think back because it sounds like just like a dodgy sales technique or something but I was genuinely like give those a miss but this is the really good ice cream this is this this mm. is that and I used to show them around and I got my regular customers and I just used to really love it didn't feel like a real job it felt like you were just kind of playing at something <laughs> and then I did business studies at school in my A levels but yeah we were saying that was lovely and all but then I didn't have a business idea and nothing ever struck me as the thing that I thought, right, I'm really passionate about that until mm -hmm. I kind of went through my personal journey with finding out I was autistic, finding out I had fibromyalgia, like chronic illness stuff, mental health stuff, and then realising how important self-care had been to me that it kind of then sparked this idea of sharing it with other people. So I guess it's kind of similar in a way that, hmm. yeah, if I'd have just finished my business studies A-level and decided, right, I'm going to open a shop somewhere, yeah, probably wouldn't have worked at all. But kind of having those life experiences and then f using that to kind of fuel a passion and an interest that you've developed in a related area, it can make it something a bit more special I think mm, definitely yeah so yeah never say never good piece of advice That's it, yeah well I've got a feeling this has probably been a long one because <laughs> if you get us together we could rabbit for hours <laughs> but thank you very much for listening and thank you mum for being on the podcast well thank you for asking me and I think if anybody sees me now at any events come over and say hello I'm not just Emma's mum you know a bit more about me now so you're all my friends, so yeah. come over and say hello. There you go, yeah. She is also interested in the same things. I don't just drag around against <laughs> her wheel. <laughs> um, so, yeah, massive thank you. Thank you for listening. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this episode. Leave me your thoughts. And obviously we'll both be able to see and respond. So thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.